September 1991, a dredging company replaced the wooden pilings around the Kinsey Street Bridge in Chicago. The pilings were supposed to protect the bridge and bridge house from the busy river traffic. But instead, they would lead to one of the greatest structural disasters in Chicago history. Seven months later. The first call came into the fire department about uh, two minutes to six in the morning. And I had heard the fire department respond to water in the basement and the merchandise mart. Approximately 17 other buildings had reported flooding by 6.30. And we're watching a strange story. Flooding reported in several loop buildings this morning. W On April 13th, 1992, something catastrophic was going on in the commercial section of Chicago, known as the Loop. Water was flooding into the basements and rapidly rising. The Loop is filled with office buildings, big corporations, the Board of Trade, the Mercantile Exchange, city and county government, state government, Marshall Fields. It actually submerged two basements, which is about 40 feet of water. So yeah, that was quite astonishing. The Chicago Fire Department immediately began evacuation. The reason being was that there's transformers in the sub-basements of the buildings. Once the water reaches a certain level in the basements, they're gonna short out the transformers, which will negate power to the buildings. In other words, you have no elevators, you have no fire protection. More than a million people were forced to leave the loop area. The flood made it a ghost town. The center of Chicago is devoid of people. It was like a neutron bomb went off. By 10 a.m., several hundred buildings in Chicago had been inundated. Chicago Fire Department trying to determine where these water main breaks are coming from. There was numerous reports of fish in the basements. And I immediately said, I know where it's coming from. It's the, it must be the tunnel. All of these older buildings had one thing in common. They were connected to the freight tunnel system and still had open entrances. This is the freight tunnel. The freight tunnel system is an underground labyrinth of passageways that runs for 60 miles under the city of Chicago. We're 40 feet down below the city of Chicago and you have this amazing network of tunnels down here. In 1898, the privately owned automatic telephone company got permission to build the tunnels. They planned to use them as a place to run the cables for their new dial telephone system. In the early 1900s, the tunnel project was expanded to include tracks for a small gauge railroad. The trains made deliveries to the basements of the stores and other businesses in the loop. They delivered coal for heating, they removed the ashes, they picked up parcels at the large department stores. The tunnels were dug by hand, 40 feet below Chicago. The rail business reached its zenith in the 1920s with more than 300 locomotives and 3,000 freight cars in operation. I couldn't stop admiring the engineering vision, the commercial vision associated with it, and the workers who build it. Some of the tunnels were built under the Chicago River. These had to be dug deeper than the underland tunnels to avoid the heavy river traffic. There were about a dozen river crossings. They were about 60 feet below the surface level or about 20 feet below the river itself. On April 13, 1992, as the water continued to deluge the loop basements, city emergency workers discovered an eddy, or small whirlpool, in the Chicago River at the Kinsey Street Bridge. The bridge was one of the areas where the freight tunnels ran underneath. Knowing that the tunnel was 60 miles long, and like seven and a half foot high and seven and a half foot wide, we knew we had a problem. Emergency crews established that the tunnel under the bridge had been breached 
they immediately tried to stem the flow of water. We walked over to the river, and there in the river was a barge um, with fire department personnel on it, throwing mattresses and, and rocks into this whirlpool in the river. It is clear that the city cannot live with a threat like this hanging over our heads. As the crews worked to stop the flood, Mayor Richard Daly called in failure analysis experts to figure out exactly how and when the tunnel was breached. The first most of the public heard about this event was the day it happened, April 13th of 1992. In fact, the events were set in motion in September of the prior year. During that time period, a company called Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Company had won the contract from the city of Chicago to replace some pilings that were used just on the south side of the Kinsey Street Bridge. This work is routine work and uh, not terribly complicated. What's required is that the, uh, the old fender pilings be extracted and then replaced with new. The pilings were clusters of 37 wooden stakes, each one 50 feet long. The dredging company was contracted to put the new pilings exactly where the old ones were. But when they got to the site, they realized that would be impossible. There had been a tender house, which is hung on the side of the bridge, that had been moved. And if we were going to put the new pilings where the old pilings had been, we would have destroyed the house. So we asked for and were given permission to move three and a half feet to the south with the new uh, cluster of pilings. The company completed their job in a week and moved on, unaware that they had placed the new pilings three feet closer to the freight tunnel than the old ones. This small move set the wheels in motion for the disaster. When you drive a pile down through a clay soil, the clay gets, has, to be, has to be moved, has to be displaced for the width of the pile. And these, you know, these piles are down at their tips or maybe a foot in diameter or so. And, and you've got 37 of them being driven down into a tight cluster. So the soil that that's driving into has to be pushed out. Well, that pushing out pushed into the side wall of the freight tunnel and made the wall collapse. That actually all happened back in September of 91. But nobody at the time knew it. In the 1990s, the freight tunnels were being used to run fiber optics, cable, and other utilities. In January of 1992, a couple of cable installers discovered the breach in the tunnel. They made a videotape of the hole and gave it to the city. But there was a bureaucratic snag. In the budget that had been developed for that fiscal year, the little unit that was responsible for um, dealing with the tunnels got moved from one department to another department and no one really knew who they reported to anymore so they just put the video aside and didn't tell anyone jurisdiction for the tunnels had been moved to the transportation department and they didn't become aware of the video and the tunnel breach until march since they knew the hole had already been there for at least two months no one felt it was an emergency but the department did seek estimates for the repair of the breach. They finally awarded a contractor $7,000 to fix the tunnel. Unfortunately, they waited too long. This was a serious problem that required immediate repairs and it should have been expedited. Local businesses dealt with the disaster the best they could. We were trying to get rid of all of the food that we possibly could because everything was shut down, the freezers, the ovens, and, and everything else. We were worried about all the people who had bought items and we're going to have them shipped to them because all those items were down in our second basement, which is, was underwater at that point. Chicago was officially declared a disaster area on April 15th, and FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, began distributing funds for the repair and cleanup process. They called up the Army Corps of Engineers and gave them the mission of finding a way to quickly plug up the hole in the tunnel and temporarily contain the water flow. Now the freight tunnel in this location actually goes in two directions. It goes east on Kenzie Street and it also goes west in Kenzie Street in two directions. So to plug the leak, we sank three shafts on each side of the river 
dropped in sandbags and then surcharged it all the way to the top of the street with stone to temporarily stop the flow. 20 feet away from there, we drove some other shafts on Kenzie Street, had divers go down into the tunnel, chipped away the debris at the bottom of the tunnel. In that case, we were able to pour concrete from the bottom of the tunnel up all the way to the top of the shaft. Once the flow was stopped, the dewatering phase could begin. More than 1.5 million tons of water had flooded the loop. As the Army Corps of Engineers pumped the water out of the loop, the mayor pulled together a team to permanently secure the tunnels. The city hired engineers and uh, there was a great effort put out and a teamwork uh, thing to prevent this thing uh, from happening. Can we uh, anticipate everything? No. You do the best you can and I think that was a great example of how engineers, contractors, and, and the city officials and that all work together. What we did is we then uh, bulkheaded every crossing at the river. So both sides of every crossing have this. And then the other thing is there's the sensors in there that trigger once the water level reaches a certain height when we get up uh, about a foot or two, it would trigger the alarm and let us know if there's water in the bulkhead. The people of Chicago took the whole event in stride. We knew we had a big problem on our hands and we worked day and night until the problem was solved. That's the Chicago, that's how Chicago works, the city that works. Sir. And it worked. Uh, the ultimate cost of the Chicago flood reached the one billion dollar mark. But in one way, the city was lucky. There were no fatalities, and in fact, no injuries were reported. Approximately 396 million gallons of water poured into the Chicago Loop during the flood, enough to fill all 110 floors of the Sears Tower. <laughs> 